Live from Arnold's Drive-In, this is Derailed Trains of Thought. Hey, Tim. Hey. This is... We've gotten a good run of places. Yeah, I know, man. We've been uh, on a time travel kick, too. We're in, like, 1950s, like, this swing and bop all around here. Man, uh, like, us. what, we're, like, 30 years earlier than last time, but still just, like, fun. Like I know. We've got a nice milkshake here, and these jams are jamming. It's like, man, this is, I wish when I was in high school, things were this cool. Oh, this is how my high school was. Oh, man, you're... Okay, you're it was not. <laughs> we didn't have a jukebox. I mean, I didn't even get a Letterman jacket, but I get... <sighs> You know, Come on now, Tim. I guess that's because I was homeschooled. <laughs> but anyways, I'm enjoying this. We get to drink some shakes. Yeah. We're doing this. Yeah. Sweet, sweet. It's it's pretty cool. Got to say it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. <laughs> but welcome, folks, to Derailed Trains of Thoughts. We wish you could be here enjoying yeah. the, the milkshakes with us. This is not our normal ho- uh, October place, but I don't mind. No, I don't mind that at all. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, this is the podcast for the creator and the consumer. Derailed Trains of Thought. And I am... Storytelling. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Nick. And I'm Tim. And we're your host for today's discussion. Discussion. Well, speaking of which, Tim. Yes. Story school. Story school. That was our quick transition to Story School, which you've not listened before, is where we discuss some topic related to storytelling, whether as a consumer or a creator. As normal, when I'm hosting, Tim has a good idea. So <laughs> That's not intentional. Just lately, the opposite person who's hosting has the idea for Story School. I don't know how. But anyways, Tim, you had this... This has been on our list for quite a while. Like, I want to say like since the very beginning, it's this has been on our list. Someday we should start Patreon. If you pay enough money, you can look at our list. <laughs> Except it's changed over time. I guess you it, can see... It, it's, it's written on stone. It's so old, some of it. <laughs> It feels that way. So, in any case, we are talking Jumping the Shark. Jumping the Shark. And again, yeah, this feels like a blast from the past in some ways, because I feel like this is a phrase that doesn't get used around the internet as often as it did, Jumping the Shark, um, like 10, 11 years ago when we first started this podcast. But it, it was enough of a topic, we put it on our list very early on, but it also feels slightly negative, which is why we probably hadn't gotten around to it. So if you're not familiar with the term jumping the shark, I will read from tvtropes.org, a classic site. It says, the expression comes from the episode of Happy Days in which Fonzie, dressed in his trademark leather jacket, literally jumps over a shark on water skis. It was stupid, over the top, and not in keeping with the show's existing tone. And basically they go on to describe how jumping the shark is kind of the point in which a show or franchise or whatever. It's like reaching for straws. Yeah, it's, it's, well, it's just not as, it suddenly is not as good or not what it used to be. They go on to point out that it doesn't necessarily indicate the end of a show. It's just how the end of the show as you know, knew it. Yeah, it, it's, it's somehow degraded in some way or transitioned into something that's no longer the same. The same. And sometimes, I don't know, if you can, can you jump the shark and be better? Well, that, I think that's one of the things we can talk about. Okay, here. So, sounds good. Because some, bi- like the term, definitely comes from a negative side of things. Yeah, and, and they would also have, you know, in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, the phrase "nuking the fridge," <laughs> nuking the fridge. I yes, the whole movie's like it's the same setup. It's just everything's a little more over the top. Like the the fridge doesn't bother me as much as like the monkey thing at the end. <laughs> and I'm like, Shia LaBeouf is not doing that. Like that makes no sense. Like Indiana Jones always has a sense of like, okay, it's a little. You know, over the top action hero y. Uh, but that was just too much for me. Or going down the, the waterfalls too many times. It's just I could everything's see, a little much. Yeah, I can see the waterfalls things being something. The monkeys never bothered me. For some reason, I just like, eh, it's, they're monkeys. George Lucas likes his wacky animals. Well, I don't mind the monkeys. I don't, it just, Shia LaBeouf like swinging with them and like, well, just, that's Tarzan. What's so I know, off about it that? just, I don't know. It didn't work for me. Okay. Well, anyway, so that's, that's kind of the base thing about uh, jumping the shark that it's just so over the top that it's, um, but as we discuss this, we'll to put a little positive spin on it we, because we don't want to just be bashing on various shows. There, but, there's nothing helpful in just doing that, right? So we'll try to we'll try to pull some 
important ideas or less what can Lesson, we learn from these you know, cases of if junk, we're of if you're a writer what should you not do or you know maybe just wow that's all you have <laughs> <laughs> if you're what should you not do what should you not do <laughs> All right, so you we just mentioned a couple of the the famous the name setters. We'll talk about a couple as they they spring to mind. Let's talk about a show that we've talked about a lot on this podcast. Oh, okay. That you could say it jumped the shark a couple times, but then kind of kept going and doing interesting things. Once upon a time. Once okay. Once upon a time. We we were talking about it the other day off air. Sometimes we wonder if we would have kept watching the show if we weren't hijacking it if we, because if we didn't have on the weekly hijack because there were certain seasons that show were just like. What are you doing? Uh-huh. So mean, what's your what what's your first memory of it being like just gone completely? I mean, obviously you have varying quality of seasons, right? I mean, the first season is probably still the best in, in a lot of ways, and I know there's some people who bailed early in the second season just because they realized, okay, you've really changed what the show is about now, so and it's not quite the same thing. I'm not interested. But in I anymore. thought the second was still, for my memory, so decent. And then yeah. I think first where I went crazy for me is. Not that it was going downhill beforehand, but the um, the Ursula, what's it, Cruella, someone else. The, what do they call that? The Queens of Darkness. The, arc? the whole because then it had and it had like Maleficent. It was just wasn't the first. Reason. Wasn't the first half of that season the Frozen one though? Yeah, which also was a hit miss ish sort of. For me, I feel like the first warning sign, like because I remember season two is like, okay, yeah, this is something different, different, but yeah. but the characters are still interesting, and they were beginning to hint toward a redemption arc for the main villains, yeah, which, which was, was cool. Nice. I remember the first real signs of trouble were early in season three with the Neverland arc. Because it just kind of got stuck. It got stuck. They were they never grew up. Yeah, well, I guess that's true. <laughs> uh, but like, there were a lot of episodes of them just wandering around the jungle of Neverland, not really making any progress. I felt like I feel like once every season and a half tended to like got, get in this quagmire, and then they'd reinvent themselves in some interesting way, and like, oh, okay, and then it just sort of like get stuck again. Yeah, I almost want to say. The quagmire is a good phrase, turn of phrase for this. So, I mean, for us, I guess you could say it jumped the shark when one of those two moments we just mentioned. Yeah. But yeah, it always wound up doing interesting things in it. But yeah, if you were patient, if you were patient, yeah. And so, I guess the lesson to, to take away is work on your pacing. Don't get stuck in a quagmire. I, I feel like this is the soap opera e kinds of shows can get into this rut a lot. And I think it happens less nowadays in some sense because of. Like once had to do once one time I had to do like twenty some episodes of the season. Yeah, and sometimes you just sort of you gotta keep you gotta writing fill, fill it in somehow. Yeah, especially especially shows that have a structure like once upon a time had the whole you had to do the flashback thing. So mm. you have to constantly come with something to flashback flashback to. to, and they had magic. So things would get very convoluted. Like oh, this is an imaginary hook. <laughs> who also used to be evil, then turned good, and then became a dream hook, and then ended up in Seattle or wherever, you know. Yeah, and in, in true soap opera fashion, everyone wound up being related to everyone yeah. else somehow. And the tricky part is, like, sometimes that works. Like, yeah. we'll say most times in Lost, it works. Mm. Everyone's related to each other. <laughs> it doesn't happen quite as much in Lost no. as it did on Once well, Upon and a I Time. Think, I think, and that's the thing, there's this thing of degrees. Jump, Jump the Shark, is there's not a line, it's almost like, there's degrees, and then mm. certain shows have a more ability to hold the weight of increasing levels of it, well, depending I, on your context and your, you know, what kind of show you are and how good your writing is. Mm-hmm. Probably the term "jumping the shark" comes to like a boat that crystallizes some of that that problem. Yeah. Maleficent's daughter. <laughs> and once upon a time, <laughs> um, for me, I have a jump the shark moment when it came to the Flash, the TV oh, show. Oh, which I've not seen much of. I know my wife used to watch all these CW shows. Eventually, she's like, Ugh. "Oh yeah, there were the, the problem with the CW verse, the all the superhero shows." Because I watched a bunch of them for a long time. The problem is I got burnt out of them because they're all <laughs> they're all written kind of the same. Yeah, which annoyed me, especially like the Flash was originally supposed to be like it's the cheerier version of you know it was written after Arrow. Yeah, and it was supposed to be cheery, and then it just got more angsty the longer it went. Well, and the thing that finally like okay, I can't, I don't think I'm going to do this show much longer was so Barry Allen, the Flash, his love interest. Got mad at him when she discovered that Barry had proposed to her in order to save her life. <laughs> like, like he had gotten, he had heard from the future that his love interest's life was in danger, and so in order to try to change the future, he proposed to her. 
And she got mad because of that. It's like, you don't love me. You just proposed to me to save my life. How dare you? I'm like, uh, how is this a problem? I mean, clearly he loves you because he proposed to you and he wants to save your life. These things are not incompatible. But at that point, it was just like they got in this habit of of just amping up drama for the sake of soap opera drama. So I guess maybe that's another lesson is this idea that shows are built on structure, especially CW shows, soap opera shows. But in order to keep making it bright and new, you keep having to either crank it up or you're going to just keep the same thing. And then eventually you crank it up into a like, what in the world is happening? <laughs> into you know? nonsense. Into nonsense. Some, yeah, some, some basically, ways. yeah, just pure nonsense. You're just like, what is going on? I mean, I didn't have quite this reaction to Legends of Tomorrow, but I know our friend Greg did. Yeah. Because they, they kept ranking up the crazy, and like, I think it's the season three finale, like, they wound up having, like, this stuffed animal that they had brought along at some point gets turned into a kaiju. Okay. And, so, and so, like, the main villain of the season three got beaten by this giant fluffy bunny thing yeah. from what I remember which I thought at the time was funny it's like okay that's that's crazy but that's kind of what the show has become I, I yeah. kind of embrace the crazy I know for Greg it was a major turn off so I, I can imagine there are people that like yeah dial up the crazy of one thing too much it's like boiling a frog you've yeah. heard that you know you just uh -huh. slowly turn up and up and up and eventually you're like at some point you're like I'm done yeah you know <laughs> I've heard people do this I have not watched the show but Supernatural I hear that with some people like it's just they're often okay. they, they just get burn out at some point. Like. Yeah. And that's always a, a trick for any long running show, which we've talked about before. Yeah. The either you you crank up the thing that people like so much that it starts becoming a parody of itself, or you change something too much and suddenly that's not what people like. For, for instance, uh, again, a lot of the factors were involved, but I stopped watching X Files when they got rid of Mulder. Yeah. You're like, this is not this is a different show. It might be a good show, but you just ruined half of what the show was. Uh -huh. And I went to college at the same time, so it was a good excuse to stop watching at the time. And I've heard the episodes are good, and they probably are, but it's a different show at that point in some way, in some manner. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of shows that you lose a, a main star. People are like, well, why is this show still ongoing? Yeah. Um, I know I never watched it, but I've heard Two and a Half Men was like that. Mm -hmm. NCIS just recently lost its main star that has been on the show for like 12 years or however oh, wow, long, yeah. 17. I don't, the show's been on forever. So a lot of people are like, okay, is this, uh, this going to last? In Agent of the Shield, you know, when they kill off Coulson, you're like, and it's a little bit jump the shark the number of different ways. They're like, but he's still around. Well, yeah, that was that was a jump of the shark moment for me, especially with the ways they had to bring him back. It's like, Okay, clearly you guys should not have killed him off in the first place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, they thought the show was ending, which I think that was a dumb way to end the show, but I guess, yeah, symmetry, I don't know. Again, and they did good, and that's the interesting thing. They still did interesting, fun stuff with it. Oh, sure. Oh, but sure. in a perfect world, yeah, um, you wouldn't do that. Yeah, probably the the second season after they did that was better than the first one after they did yes, that. Yes, I would agree with that. But yeah. anyway, that's neither here nor there. So, yeah, but we were talking about, like, sometimes changing up too much is bad. And in some ways, I think part of that is that you're – another lesson we can pull out of this is that you shouldn't betray your story or your audience. Yeah, and th those are tricky. And I think those are two different things in some ways. But if you're betraying the story, it means you've kind of reneged on something that – how the story – how the character should work. Or how well, the atmosphere where you've created. Unless you're a show that has perfectly cultivated a sense that I can be a tragedy sometimes and a comedy other times. Mm -hmm. Or betraying your audience be – audiences don't like being lied to. Mm -hmm. I, rem I remember with Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Okay, yeah. They made a big deal with the buildup for the wedding episode, the wedding of Lois Lane and Clark Kent. Yeah. It was really cool. It was all, you know, and all the advertisements, it was awesome. And the episode leading up to it, it was kind of, you know, they're preparing for their wedding, but there was also a Monster of the Week story well, yeah. with, with yeah. like, clones. The problem was, at the end of the episode, you realize they got married, but Lois Lane had been replaced by a clone. Um. And there's that's so comic booky. It, it is comic booky, but there's it is a very frustrating thing to have told. This is what the story is. No, it's secretly a tie in to future stories. So now you're hooked, aren't you? <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Like, no, don't do that to me. You should treat, yeah, you should treat the audience with respect as if they're intelligent, not bait and switching them. I mean, and that was that was like from back in the 90s. And I remember. Yeah, Lois and Clark was never quite the same after that. Even more recently, though, they're still doing this. I was I just read a really interesting run of Justice League comics. Oh yeah, you mentioned this on your yeah on Twitter, Twitter on Twitter by Scott Snyder, and 
when I first started, I was a little unsure. It's like, oh man, this looks like it's going to be a big event thing. But I got into it. It was really interesting pace, and it it did tie into a lot of DC history. But it was a cool story with the Justice League and uh, Lex Luthor leading the Legion of Doom, and uh, they kept pulling in all these cosmic ideas. And so I read about five volumes of it, and the fifth volume definitely said on the back, "This is the conclusion of the storyline." And then the last three pages, it was like, nope, we're going to finish. You have to go into this other thing. And, and here's the other problem. This conflict, they kept having these like false climaxes. Okay. It's like, we have to complete this or we're all doomed. Or it's like, well, okay, that didn't work out well. So let's do that. Here's another plan. Let's do this. And then you lead up to that. And then that doesn't work out. And now we're all doomed. And it turned out to another. And, and what's even more annoying, it was a lead in to a tie in that wasn't even in the Justice League comic book series. <laughs> it was like a standalone thing. So like if you were subscribed to Justice League, what the next issue would have been just like, Oh, everything's back to normal. Here's just a regular old story. Oh. So in some ways, it seems like a lot of our jumping the shark has been things that are almost like manipulative or rating oriented things. Like, we need your attention. Yeah. Please look at us. Yes. Please keep us relevant. As opposed to being like, just tell a good story. Now, what do you think? It seems like some reaction to say Last Jedi would say jump the shark. Mm. Would you agree with that? Or is that just they didn't like it? Uh, that's a, I mean, I don't know. I'd have to talk to someone who had a, a more intense dislike of that movie yeah. than I do. <laughs> Cause I mean, I guess if you wanted just a scene, there's just a Mary Poppins scene. People might say, I just call it the Mary Poppins. Scene. Oh, you mean the, the Leia? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But as a whole thing is again, is it just being creative and the divisive or is it jump of the shark? What is the difference between the two? That that is they hard. changed a lot of stuff. Yeah, went, that's a hard question because the people who liked the Last Jedi really like the risks that Rian Johnson took and the different things. The people who don't is like, no, that's not my Star Wars. And, and maybe maybe here's the thing: maybe that's still something you shouldn't do or should think hard about before doing. But it seems to me, at least, most of our definite jump in the shark is where the story ideas are just running out. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, I, and that's not what happening in the Last Jedi. No, How, whatever your disagreements with it is, yeah. it's not that. No, I, I concur. I mean, if you're going to make an argument for running out of ideas, that's probably more of the issue with J.J. Abrams movies yeah. than the Last Jedi and what's going on in the Last Jedi. So, yeah, I can see that. Although, I guess a lot of the examples we've been talking about are the like the your creative tank is running on empty, so you go bigger and crazier or stranger. Like or stranger. I remember. I can't remember very well, so my my memory might be flawed here, but way back in the 90s, there was a sh show called Sequest. Do you watch Sequest? A little bit. And the first season was great. It was all underwater and everything. Then the second season, like, suddenly they have to do with space aliens and stuff. We're like, <laughs> this is a sea show. What's going on here? I mean, it's supposed to be underwater, yeah, not in outer space. And I know that, at least back in the 90s, there seems like a lot of science fiction shows. They'd be pretty good season or two, and then they get weird mm. because they... You weren't prepared for it, but the, like the science fiction element just became stranger and stranger. Okay. Um, I, I wish I had another example. I think maybe um, one of those uh, one of those Gene Roddenberry shows that okay. Andromeda, uh -huh. I think, was Kevin Sorbo, I think, did that in, okay. for the second season. Yeah. Well, was there a change in showrunner? I don't. I didn't even pay attention to that sort of stuff back then. Yeah, because I remember with uh, the show Martial Law, which I loved the first season for. It was a really cool Samo hung. Uh, martial arts show, yeah. which I think was actually the first time I'd actually ever seen that. Oh, that introduced me to like martial arts that movies. Show. Yeah, yeah. But then they got new producers for the second season, and they wound up like losing actors. They get a completely different set, a very different feel for the rest. And it had like three of the same characters, but it was a different show, and it was still kind of neat, but it just didn't have the same vibe that that no. you had fallen in love with the show. Is with. that a sh jumping the shark, or is that just bad choices? I mean. <laughs> I mean, it was a jump of the shark because it was, in some ways, because it was just so drastically different. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a couple episodes into the new season. You're like, well, I guess this is the show now. So, so just, I'm just asking, do you think, say, like Heroes season one? Yes. Everyone loved. Mm -hmm. Season two, something like, everyone's like, what is this show? Well, I, is that, or is that just bad writing? I mean, what's the, is the difference basically just, you know, either I've run out of ideas, but it's bad writing, or it's like I've run out of ideas, I'm desperately trying to, Gain attention. I mean, that the difference between Jump the Shark and just eh. just bad writing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it depends on how strictly you want to go with your jumping the shark definitions yeah. here. I guess. I mean, for me, even the jump the shark moment of Heroes is potentially the season finale of season one. Okay. Because I remember feeling like, 
they had been building up to this moment that entire season. Yeah. And then the finale, this is when it was all supposed to happen. And it just kind of fell flat. Mm. I mean, it wasn't nearly as epic as they had built it up to be. Yeah. And which kind of made you feel like, and then like subsequently on the show, it felt like they were constant, like the show only knew how to build, set things in motion. It didn't seem to be very good at like dealing with consequences, consequences or, 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 or fallout or development. It was just always like, oh, here's this new thing. Oh, here's this new thing. Shiny, shiny. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so I guess you could say that's bad writing, but again, I could pinpoint the beginning of the, the turn the from, turn. from bat from, from great. Like I remember at the time lost season three was coming out and I remember at the time liking more of what heroes was doing than what loss was doing. Yeah. But then it just was never quite as good after that, that finale. That makes sense. So it seems what we're learning here is that one, write well, <laughs> but two, have the interest in your show be based on actual conflict and resolution and not on gimmicks concepts. or concepts or it's bigger than last time we did it. Yeah, I think this is one thing that some people don't always realize about stories that interesting action visuals, even colorful characters. I think sometimes weak stories sometimes get a, get away with being weak just because the characters are interesting, and yeah. so people enjoy the human connection. But missing a deeper idea underneath it all. Even that, if, that, e that, that binds all the ideas together. Right. Like, even if it's just a simple action story, those will connect with people more if there are deeper ideas built into the cake. And I guess we've said this on the show before, but it just occurred to me because like a lot of times people will gravitate toward, oh, the characters are so fantastic or the cinematography or or this or the graphics yeah. wh or what have you. But if there's not if there's not some deep philosophy behind that sometimes, I mean, and sometimes, again, it could be a simple thing. I mean, um, this is the reason everyone loves Taken. It's an yeah. idea. Mm hmm that people can identify with. His philosophy is not just, I'm going to go and beat people up. It's like, I have a special set of skills and I'm protecting my daughter. Yeah. And even something that's not super story based, I've been thinking recently about Super Smash Brothers. Yeah. Big surprise because Sora just got into it and it's a huge Wait, deal. Who, but... Where's Sora from, Tim? <sighs> Kingdom Hearts. Okay. But here's the, the reason for non-gamers who may not realize this, why this was such a big deal. And it's, he was the last new fighter character in uh, the DLC for Smash Brothers Ultimates, which they've been making new announcements about fighters ever since when the game was first announced back in 2018. And Smash Brothers is really like a crossover with lots of video game characters. Mm -hmm. And it originally started out as kind of a celebration of Nintendo. But at this point, it's really become a celebration of video games in general. And they did a fantastic job each time they announced a new character with a trailer that really like had suspense, like either who is it going to be? Or sometimes you just saw the character and it's like, OK, what is this? is the trailer for a new game? Oh, no, it's a smash reveal. They were really good at telling a story with those. And in that sense, I guess it's just building hype in some ways, yeah. but it's also building this like feeling of this is a great thing that we love celebrating all these characters and all these worlds that they're from. Mm -hmm. They all come together in this one thing. So that's kind of the I would say the meta narrative yeah. behind it. I guess it's hard to jump the shark if you already have boundaries on what your world is. Yeah. I mean, Fonzie jumping an actual shark in a show that's about <laughs> 50s nostalgia nostalgia makes no sense i mean yeah th that seems like it's kind of a tie-in it was probably a tie-in to jaws at the time oh when, okay, yeah. when when sharks were becoming part of the public consciousness but you know if if your meta narrative is like hey we're recapturing the nostalgia of the 50s then you're saying like the shark has nothing to do with this Let's yeah get rid of this uh -huh. you know we can do all kinds of jumping or trash cans or whatever be that feels 50 ish uh-huh you know, you mentioned before we started recording, wondering, so how come with all the crazy things Lost did, yeah. that for, for us at, at least, it never really jumped the shark? And it, sh I mean, it should have. I mean, several times. I mean, you talk to anyone who doesn't know Lost, they'd be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but somehow they paced it well enough. It was constantly surprising. Don't yes. get me wrong. But it didn't like dump a whole lot of surprising on you at any one time. It was very like kind of gradual. Like we're gonna do this, and you're like we're gonna do that. Or so like what's this button do? I don't know. What does it do? But it had a meta narrative, a very strong one. And uh, yeah, and like this core idea of like 
this is a mysterious world. There's a this unseen battle between light and dark. There's this whole destiny versus free will, will. Uh, science versus faith. All was my things. purpose. All yeah. To me, if there was jump the shark moment, and there's not, I loved it. But like when the island disappears, you're like. That's insane. <laughs> but, you know, when you have the third episode, this guy miraculously starting to walk, mm-hmm. and then you have weird time travel, missile things, and a fair, a scientist. I mean, they, they give you clues to say, this is a magical island. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the magical island never really does anything outside what the magical island, we already had enough clues about movement or things, you know, so it's insanely surprising as it is. Mm-hmm. It was cons- always consensus worldview. If there was anything where it jumped the shark, is saying like, "Oh yeah, your tattoos mean something." <laughs> um, but that's, again, that's not a it's not a ruin the show moment. That's just a bad episode. Exactly. Yeah. So having and the thing, whatever you want to say about Lost, and we'll say all kinds of stuff about Lost, good or Weekly Hijack, uh-huh. is that it had a very focused, I don't know, focused, very comprehensive idea of what it was about. Hmm. It wasn't just trying to be the next cool thing. It had this underlying, like you said, things about destiny, free will, purpose, religion, all this stuff that I think shows that try to imitate it later on. They were just trying to imitate the shock value. Yeah, the surface level. The surface level stuff. And they didn't have what I think were basically Dan Lindelof and Carlton Cuse's worldview. It's interesting to have a show that basically the undertone is big philosophical ideas basically manifest in a big island mystery. Yeah. We've covered a lot of ground here. Yes. So we've talked about how you don't want to betray the story or your audience. You need to keep your story fresh while keeping it true to what you've established. And honestly, having that bigger picture will probably help you out a lot with that. Yeah, whatever that picture is, you know, and doesn't like you've said, Tim, it doesn't have to be something giant. It doesn't have to be about all the philosophers of history and we'll just name every character after them sort of thing. I mean, Phineas and Ferb's big idea is basically make the most of your summer, make yeah. the most of your life. Go out there and do crazy things and, and, and that sustains it. There was very little that they didn't do, Yeah, you know, but they set that up from the beginning. I mean, when your first episode was building a roller coaster, uh-huh. there's not a lot of other crazier ways to go. You know, well, you know, actually, they found quite a few. But. Well, yeah, but but by that you already established, and I guess just early on established what are the boundaries here. Mm-hmm. Don't surprise, like, aha, there's <laughs> actually ghosts in this world that we've never mentioned in the last 200 pages. <laughs> you know, is that from an actual no, example? I just made that up. Okay, just no. curious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tim. With that, we will go to our first soundtrack. soundtrack being the most important part of our podcast according to my brother is um he does not actually no say he, that. he skips it routinely so religiously we like, we like picking on him especially since he probably doesn't even listen to our soundtrack intros no he doesn't he just he's gone now so we can just say whatever we want about him <laughs> anyway so once upon a time there was a thing called teenage mutant ninja turtles i've heard of it i think yeah and then after that there were samurai pizza cats I've heard of that, but I've never actually seen it. I think I've seen that episode. And then there were also Biker Mice from Mars. Biker Mice from Mars. Yes, which is also cartoon. I think I might have seen an episode once upon a time. But So what do these have in common? They like to just throw words together. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Anyways. You can't just be a a cool cat. You have to be a cool cat from outer space or something. Or cool mice. Mice. Biker mice. A biker mice from Mars. From Mars. But anyways, I don't know if the show was good or not, but it gives that idea of like, Jumping the shark. Like, we've just gone, we took a cool franchise and we've just copied it in the weirdest way. I mean, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles should not have worked. No. <laughs> but it does and it's fun. So, and maybe Biker Mice from Mars did too. I don't know. But there's a video game of it in any case. And I found a remix of it, which is pretty rocking by Will Rock. That's a remix by Will Rock called Rock and Ride. And I think you will enjoy, unless your name is Zach Hayden.
You are an intelligent person. You do not desire to use your precious time on this rock, spinning in the vastness of space, to listen to laymen discuss such topics as which make-believe male fantasy would win in a computer-generated fistfight, or which brain-damaged, testosterone-fueled man-child will catch a pigskin next Sunday. Listen to podcasts that match your refined tastes and interests. Listen to Sirius XM. We are serious scholars who expiate on serious subjects. Any one of our dozens of erudite discussions is sure to tickle the neurons of your cerebellum. Here is a smattering of our extensive offerings. Dialectical materialism, British colonialism, and the social imaginary of Curious George. An ongoing series that lays bare the extensive extra-governmental complex of systems at the heart of modern society. In the beginning, the universe said that there be dark matter. Our interview shows with scientific geniuses from around the world and their own unedited, monotonous, sesquipedalian words. The infantilization of the 99.9% and how we save them from themselves. Policy, ethics, and human progress in an entertaining lecture-style format. And finally, our award-winning 10-part documentary, Cheese. Serious XM. We're serious about being serious. And welcome back. Hello, hello. Hello. Uh, great music, I think. Yes. And um, a different sort of um, advertiser today. Yeah. Where do you get these guys? Wherever I can find them. Back alley sometime. <laughs> oh, wow. He didn't sound like he was from a back alley. No, but... he sent me several dozen emails desperate for someone to advertise. So. Oh, I see. Okay. But he paid in euros, so we're good. Oh, can you cash those in still? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, and so next is... Challenge accepted. All right, Tim. So, off here, we're trying to figure out the best way to challenge each other today. Often, you will challenge me to something that I may fail at or not. Yep. And so today, we decided. Just look, I decided we're going to look at some on Wikipedia some of the list of television shows considered the worst. The worst. They're just the worst. Apparently, these jump the shark. Maybe from day one. From day one. <laughs> they're like, done. <laughs> um, and so how we're going to try to do this, uh, we're doing categories here. We've got a couple categories. We're going to do animated shows first. Okay. I'm going to list you four titles. Four titles. And then I'm going to give you a line or two from one of their descriptions okay. in Wikipedia. And you're going to tell me which one it is. Okay. Do you want the description first or the titles first? Um, give me the titles and the description, and then I may ask for the titles again. Okay, titles. The Brothers Grunt. Bucky and Pepito, Father of the Pride, and Lassie's Rescue Rangers. <laughs> Lassie's Rescue Rangers. Or Lassie's Rescue Rangers. What a ripoff. Okay. All right. Yes. So I just I saw this sentence here. I thought it was going to be worth using. So here's here's your clue. Kenneth R. Clark of the Chicago Tribune wrote that MTV quote created the most repulsive creatures ever to show up on the television screen. Hmm. Okay. So is that the Brothers Grunt? Bucky and Pepito, Father of the Pride, or Lassie's Rescue Rangers? I'm going to go with the Brothers Grunt. You're correct. Yay! Yeah, or boo! Boo! <laughs> yeah, apparently, yeah, this is, uh, compared to this, Beef and Butthead looks like a masterpiece of social satire. Yeah. So apparently, yeah. It sounds uh, like something that would, would have come out in the 90s. Sophomoric half hour that leaves the viewer longing for the refined good taste of Alice Cooper. <laughs> All right, let's try one more. So we got... Uh, you have three left. Bucky and Pepito, oh, Father okay. the Pride. One more from these three. Oh, yeah. okay. And then Lassie's Rescue Rangers. Yeah, I just thought, why not? Sure. Okay, the show was described by Fast Company technology editor Harry McCracken as setting, quote, a standard for awfulness that no contemporary TV cartoon has managed to surpass. Wow. <laughs> these are great quotes, aren't they? <laughs> um... All right, I can do this. Morrow wrote that the show, quote, managed to set TV animation back to the early crude days. Interesting. Okay. So what are the three again? Bucky and Pepito, Father the Pride, or Lassie's Rescue Rangers. I'll go with that first one, Bebby and Pepito. Bucky and Pepito. Bucky and Pepito. Yes, it is. All right. Correct. Correct. You are correct. I'm correct. Apparently it's horribly stereotyped too. 
Okay. Um, so there you go. Uh, those, those other two sounded a little too safe. They sounded a little too kid friendly than what the description. Mm, was it doesn't sound like Father the Pride is. Oh really? It I was apparently was ridiculously about... crude adult oriented humor. Oh, it's not super for children. Well, unless you do stuff that I don't want to read online. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. I, I guess I had, I had assumed it was like about lions or something. Well, if it was, it's beyond uh, Lion King. <laughs> okay. All right. What's our okay, next? let's try uh, dramas and soap operas. Okay. Ooh, we got a lot of these. Ooh, let's okay. All right. So here's the sentence I'm giving you for this one. These are dramas and soap operas. Okay. Dramas and soap operas. So you're giving me the description first this time? Yeah. The description is it is the most expensive series ever aired in the United States at that time. Okay. Okay. So is it Cop Rock, El Dorado, Ironside, or Super Train? <laughs> uh, I feel like you need a, do you need to phone a friend <laughs> uh, yeah I've never heard of any of these um, torn between El Dorado and Super Train um, I'll do oh, let's try El Dorado nah. oh no it is actually Super Train Super Train okay it was also beset by problems including a model train that crashed oh wow um, it was during the 1978-79 season, so I don't know how much money they were spending back then, but at that point, it was the most expensive TV show. Does it say what the story was? Uh, let's see here. No, but it's been called one of the greatest television flops. Huh. AV Club know that Zuber Train has a reputation as one of the worst television series made. It was hugely expensive, little watch, and critically derided. Oh, well, sorry right. to hear that. All right, let's do one more of these dramas. I'm really curious, though. Is the, did the train have superpowers, or was I, it... <laughs> what, what, is, what, what does what the show about this? a train mean? What is this? Okay, so here we go. Many of the cast were inexperienced actors whose limitations were clearly exposed on such a new and ambitious project. The acting was derided as amateurish, or the attempt to appear more European by having people speak other languages without subtitles... <laughs> or bizarre, unconvincing accents was meant by viewers with incomprehension or en ridicule. <laughs> All right. So, so maybe it was more of a love boat sort of situation. So anyways, is this, I'll, I'm going to include some of the old ones here. Oh, so this is a super, I thought you were giving me no, the No, this is not a super train. train. This is a new oh. one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is not super All train. All right, I'm excited. This is right. a new one. So this on Cop Rock, El Dorado, Ironside. I'll just leave it three that we did last time. Oh, the same three. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Hmm. So apparently they just speak in ridiculous accents for no good reason. Cop Rock, El Dorado, Ironside. Ironside. I'm going to go El Dorado again. Why? Because it sounds like it was trying to be more hoity-toity, and those other two names sound like there's more hard-hitting kind of sound to it. Oh, see, Ironside always makes me think of the old battleships. Like well, back in- that was my first thought, but then I was like, well, no, if it's like an 80s show, maybe it was like... Oh, actually, Ironside, I'll tell you just right now, it's 2013. Oh, really? Yeah. No, you don't have to change your mind. I was just giving you details. Okay. Well, I'm still going to go with El Dorado, I think. Oh, you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to fake me out. So apparently it's a BBC soap opera from 1992. El Dorado is remembered as an embarrassing failure for the BBC. It is sometimes used as a byword for any unsuccessful, poorly received, or overhyped television program. Ouch. Apparently not here in the U.S., but apparently England is like, oh, it's another El Dorado. Mm-hmm. Or like... It's another El Dorado or some sort of ridiculous <laughs> accent. <laughs> I don't think they, they sound like that in Great Britain. No, no, but this show's full of poor I, accents. I get I get so. it. <laughs> okay, we're doing fantasy and science fiction. There's only three listed on the on the Wikipedia. Okay. So it's gonna be a little vague. Not the vague, but you'll get this one probably. But okay. I just like these quotes here. Okay, these are quotes from various actor at uh, various magazines and newspapers okay. about the show. A disappointment on every level. A messy, miserable show, jaw-droppingly awful television, even worse, it's boring. The worst thing this company has done in decades. Wow. Okay, so here's your, here's your three options in the order they're listed. Galactica, 1980, Inhumans, Manimal. <laughs> Inhumans, this is the show you saw? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go with Inhumans, actually. I, I, that was a giveaway, but yes. And I would always agree with all those things. <laughs> That's it, so sad. Oh, it should have been a great... It was It was bad. I forgot. Jumping the Shark is Inhumans. Like, there were about two good actors, and everything else was horrible. It seems like one of the biggest misfires in Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oh, see, that's one... I didn't say that. Um, 
And humans has no reason to exist except that Marvel wanted it to by any means necessary. <laughs> I would love to hijack it with you, Tim. At some point, I probably need to actually see this thing since you've you've hyped it up so much as something so terrible. And it, it, I mean, we need to hijack it. <laughs> it just didn't like get Zach there. It will just tear it apart. Tear it apart. Oh boy, it'd those, be fun. Those poor people are probably haven't they suffered enough, Nick? No. <laughs> 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 Actually, one of the actors I like I like Black Bolt. He was fun. And the guy who played Maximus I thought was fun. It was really bad. We had just read this great miniseries, like kind of Shakespearean miniseries in humans graphic novel. Uh-huh. And then I watched this show. <laughs> it was just, I mean, I don't know if it's as horrible as all that, but it was it was pretty darn bad. And I was I'm pretty forgiving on yeah, shows. You're yeah, we are very forgiving and to be and that just, disappointed by it. Was it. Just, and what's his name? I think Desmond's on it. Oh really? Oh, yeah, hmm. briefly, and maybe Miles. Actually. Is it on Disney Plus? It is now. Oh my! It is now. Okay, go watch it, everyone. <laughs> maybe. Okay, I think for this one, Tim, we're going to switch it up for now. These are game shows. Oh, okay. I am going to read you the title. Okay. And if you get anywhere close to the actual contest, I'll give you a point. Okay. Okay. I don't know how this is gonna work. I've I've what, got what two points so far. Did I get the, see? I got you the, got three. You got almost all of them. You got you only missed the first El Dorado thing. The I Super said. Train. Super Train. Yes. Which can you just imagine like just trans like a transformer transforming <laughs> like it's like a Power Rangers thing and just Super starts Train beating up Godzilla. It's Super Train. Yeah, that's that sounds like a, a Japanese like kind of run show. by the conductor. What are, what are those called? The like what's Nathan's doing now? The um the Henshin. Henshin. Yes, that could be a Super Train. The Henshin show. Yes. All right, Tim. So your first game show. Okay. Um, it's British. British. Okay. 2011. Don't scare the hair. Okay. Don't scare the hair. Don't scare the hair. Okay. Get in the get in the general vicinity of this game. Oh, so that's right. I'm I'm supposed to Yeah, don't on. scare the hair. Okay, this is this is a stealth based show where it's it's actually it's kinda like what apparently I've not actually seen the show, but apparently yeah. it is what Squid Game was before there was a Squid Game. Oh, do so you die? No, you don't actually die, okay. but but contestants are trying to sneak through this thing without triggering this giant anthropomorphic rabbit. That will pop out of uh, basically kind of a toy box sort of thing and scare you. But I guess that's kind of backwards. <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> I should, don't let the hair scare you. Okay. Maybe, okay, I'll take that back. It's not an, a giant anthropomorphic bunny. Maybe it's actually an, an, actual, an actual rabbit that contestants have to, to give answers very, they have this rabbit sitting in their arms and they have to give their answers very quickly and calmly. They can't be n- noisy or loud like Americans at all. Uh, <laughs> is it one of those two things? Well, which one? I think I'm going to go with the latter just because it's... I will tell you, I was almost going to give you points for the first one. Oh, really? Yeah, not for the second. Okay. So apparently there's a giant animatronic rabbit. It really is. A, there really is a giant animatronic rabbit. Oh, man. And they had to do like crazy things like jumping around inside of beanbags to turn off alarm clocks and make sure the hair, do, the giant animatronic rabbit doesn't wake up or get scared by all the loud noises in the con, in the competitions they're doing. Okay. <laughs> it did go well, apparently. Okay. Can I get a point for the first one, even though I changed my mind? Half a point. Half a point. Half okay. a point. Yay. I'm like, wow, you're actually getting the giant anthropomorphic Rabbit, and then you and then you gave up on it. <laughs> it suddenly started to sound too ridiculous. <laughs> if it's a bad TV show, there's nothing too ridiculous. <laughs> all right, I, though I do like the, I like the idea of you know all these American game shows are loud and raucous. I like the idea of the British one being like, okay, try to be as calm as possible and give us your answers. But apparently, it was it was loud and raucous. Yeah, so, so, so there they're go. trying not to be though. I, so I guess I guess so. All right, uh, I will not give you Naked Jungle, which I think you can probably figure out what that one's about mm, probably another british tv show apparently their tv show they either make more game shows and they some of them don't work or they just when they don't work they don't work okay this one is called shafted 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 um this is a game show where contestants have to climb up an elevator shaft before that falls down on them it's just that that, that, seems, that, that seems more american than british again but <laughs> Or New York, even. New York, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, incorrect. Okay. 
I, I wish you could say correct because I'd actually <laughs> probably watch that show. Yeah. Hopefully it's not as violent did, as it did sounds. Did you ever see that reality? I, I guess it was kind of a game show where they like, it was like a murder mystery. Uh, we've talked about it. it no, I, I don't think I ever it watched good. it. Anyways, no, in this game, this is kind of actually kind of interesting. The host reads a couple, the first three or four words of the question, then he pauses, and everyone writes down how much money they want to receive if they get it right, up to $2,500. Okay. But the person who writes the most money down is immediately out. Oh. Which is interesting. Uh-huh. And then they complete the question. Okay. And then they answer it. If they get it right, they get that money. If they get it wrong, they lose that money. Okay. And it keeps going like that. And at the end, I guess you can choose to share the winnings with the other person. And you both take the money. Okay. So, yeah. Apparently, something must not have worked, though, if it's it showed up on this list. So, like, here's an example. I, this actually, it sounds kind of clever, honestly. Prompt, which major planet? And then you go say, how much you want to make? Mm. But the question is, like, which major planet Hollywood investor? So, like, <laughs> they would mislead him with the first three oh, okay. words. Uh-huh. So, I don't know. It's th- after four episodes, he just dropped it. And it's listed as one of the worst... British television shows of the 2000s. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. So final, final thing. I'm going to give you reality TV series. Okay? I'm okay. going to give you, re- read you some, like with old school, mm-hmm. and t- see if you can figure out which one. Oh, okay. wait. Okay. Going back to the description first yes. method. Okay. These game shows are very different. Okay. Um, but I do like at the end of one of them, it says, a petition was made on change.org to end the show with more than 60,000 supporters. <laughs> Because, for among other things, it was cynical and repulsive for passing off his exploitation as uplifting inspirational TV. Wow. Okay. So, here are your options. There are five. Usually there are petitions that keep shows going. Not yeah, this one's around. like, get it off. <laughs> so, The Swan, The Briefcase, Jersey Shore, The One Making of a Music Star, and Here Comes Honey Boo Boo. Ooh. I've heard of a couple of these. Yeah, I know. I, I this is the first one I've heard of some of these. Yeah. Huh. I'm going to go with the last one actually, which was Here I comes over. Here comes Honey Boo Boo. Yes. You are incorrect. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. So, it is the briefcase. Listen to this. Oh, really? An American reality TV series created by Dave Broom. Um, in each episode, two American families undergoing financial hardship are given a briefcase containing $101,000. It must decide whether to keep all the money for themselves or give some of it or all of it to another family. Over the course of 72 hours, each family learns about the other and makes a decision without knowing that the other family has also been given a briefcase with the same instructions. Uh, Others compare the show to fictional films and television that pit needy against each other, such as Twilight Zone, et cetera, et cetera, Hunger Games. Um, so the oh. idea is that like, neither of them know they have the money and they have to decide, they're, and they're both hard up, uh-huh. and they have to decide. Oh, okay. So I think it was very exploitative and... Of low-income families. Yeah, and cynical. Yeah. Huh. That's... It's right one of those things that someone thought was a good idea, and then in practice, everyone watched it, just felt kind of icky yeah, watching it's like, it. Yeah, this, this doesn't feel quite right. What do you think okay. about this? What if someone decided to keep it, and the other family who needed it decided to be generous and give it away? Yeah. Oh. Then one family ends up with $200,000, the other family doesn't get anything. Oh, that's, okay, that's awful. Yeah, that's so. that's almost like the the Joker's gambit from Dark Knight. Exactly, it is. Yeah, <laughs> except without lives at stake. That's yeah, that's kind of, that is kind of a little messed up. So you're just saying that the that Hollywood executives are like Joker. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so if we've learned anything from this challenge, except is one is that you're very good at this. Well, thanks. <laughs> and two, that there's a lot of bad TV shows out there. There apparently so. Yes, like, and and people will try various things. Doesn't always mean creative. Doesn't always mean it's good. Yes, that is very very true. All right, so we actually have a third section today. That's right, which we do. Is well, I guess soundtrack is our okay. Section. That's that's the eternal <laughs> section. Eternal? Are we gonna be doing the podcast throughout uh, eternity? No, but um, there will be soundtracks throughout eternity, even when we stop. <laughs> We'll retire after, like, episode 307 and we'll be like, but here's 200 more episodes of Soundtrack. Oh, okay. But we're going to Project Update. Wow, we haven't done one of these in a while. And it's important because there is an actual update. There is an actual update. So, Tim. Yes? I'm the host, but you have the news, so. (laughs) I'm the man of the news. Well, long-time listeners... Long time listener. Long time. (laughs) I think this actually goes all the way back to episode one, crazy enough. 
may have heard of a little thing, a little project dream I had for a while called Darian Story. Darian Story. We uh, we actually referenced it in... Um, we met Darian. We met Darian, yes. In, in the Realm of Derailed Thoughts, episode 100. Yes. Along with uh, two guys called Strin and Fred. Yes, who were also stuck in what... It was like the morass of something. Some uh, location where of uh, forgotten stories. Things or something that like never that. get done. Things that never get done. Well, yeah. listeners, this summer I actually took it upon myself to... To burn dairy. No. <laughs> to destroy all my... De- no. I actually finished a complete first draft of Darian's story, which is, honestly, though, it is a prologue to a longer book, theoretically. But it's a self-contained, mostly self-contained story. It is mostly a self-contained story. Nick can vouch for this. He yes. has read it. It's, it's good. It's it well exists. Written. It exists. So I was thankful to get his feedback, and it was, it was kind of surreal in some ways, because, yeah, this story has been in my head. The vi- Well, the germ of it first came it's as old as... 2003, <laughs> 2003, 2004, somewhere around there when I was a sophomore in college, which is crazy. I mean, it's been in my head for like almost 18 years, which is nuts to finally actually get it written down. It's and on paper. It's, it's real now. It's real now. I, I think I had first actually started writing it like the like the very first scene. I think I wrote in like 2015 or something. But yeah, it was a rough process because <laughs> as always, I'm not in the habit of writing as regularly as Nick is, is you, at least your fiction or normally, writing. Yeah. Yeah, normally. Maybe this, this, this year has been, been a little kind of, wonky, but It's yes. been a little weird, yeah. So it was always, it's always kind of daunting to realize, oh man, creating this, this is hard work. Because <laughs> I knew a lot of big picture ideas. I'd had the structure in my head for quite a while, but then once you actually sit down, it's like, oh, there's always all these world building you have to come up with. Like, what are these soldiers' uniforms going to look like? And how is this scene going to play out? How do I choreograph this and all this stuff? And my goal was to get it written this summer before, um, I guess that's another update I have. I'm currently in rehearsals for another play. Oh, yeah. And doing a play with All for One Productions again, Woo-hoo. which we talked about back. I did a couple of plays with them back in 2019, doing another one, uh, an adaptation of Great Expectations. But I really wanted to get this draft of Darian's story done by the time that started at the end of September. And uh, I cut it a lot closer than I was expecting. I remember thinking, it's like, all right, I'm finally, if I can just get to the climax, it'll go quickly. And then I'm like, all right, I'm at the climax. And I'm still writing the climax. And then at one time, I thought it was going to be top heavy one way. But then I realized later on, it's like, oh, no, the climax is probably right. It's in act three. So it's right yep. where it should be kind of in the middle of the book or middle of the story. Yeah. So it worked. No, it's a good story. It well, works well. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm. Yeah, it's been a, it was a surreal process, but it's it's nice to finally see. If I die tomorrow, that thing is out there. Is in the there? World. You can. I'll publish it po- post. How do you say that? Posthumously. Posthumously, and then I'll, I'll go back to all your previous drafts and publish a book about all your, how it's changed over the years. <laughs> I don't think I. And actually... then I'll, and then I'll write an outline for, from your notes on the whole novel, and then we'll sell it out to a ghostwriter, and yeah, we'll make a movie out of it. Yeah, It'll be good. You'll make a lot. Not, of... not about the book, about your your making of the book. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's that's good to know. Yeah, I'll be rich. So, yeah. As always. Yes. You always seem to get rich off our ventures. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's it's quite nice. I'm the third most uh, richest person in Duckburg. <laughs> I really need to get in on this somehow. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know how you keep pulling it off. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's that's what I've been up to. Um, yeah, it's real. Like it, I remember being it being kind of weird when I realized how long I'd been talking about Darian at some point. When I think my roommate before, well, this is back before I was married. Yeah, my roommate mentioned, "Oh, are you talking about Darian?" It's like, "Oh, yeah, I guess people know about that, don't they?" <laughs> it's out in the world, it's out in the world. But I yes. like this Strand Fred book four thing. Yes. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> book three has been uh, has had a complete draft that's been sitting around for a while. Yeah, one of these days. One of these days. One of these days. You've been uh, in a new world with, with school teaching. Teaching and everything. Yeah. And getting my rhythm better now. I guess I will just mention, we had mentioned the, I think on the previous podcast that I was writing this NFT, Choose Your Own Adventure thing. I did finally finish it. Cool. Which was, And I think it's one of my longest single, pro, like non-novel projects. Okay. Um, my brother, who's kind of the one delivering it as an NFT, keeps trying to find new ways to put it out because it's basically straight new ground. The best ways to to read it, especially if you're not like a crypto maniac. Yeah. Um. So he keeps Maybe trying to find ways to do that. Try to give an explanation of NFTs for people who don't know what it is, because I have a hard time. I'd have a hard, have a hard time, time too. <laughs> I mean, it's a non fungible token. There you go. That's what it stands yeah. for. No, it's a. Uh, 
is a unique like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or unique things with a with a it's a piece of code basically piece of code a blockchain that keeps track of all the transactions it's had NFTs are basically is a electronic asset that's unique to itself and can be transferred and you can see the line of ownership and so like you know baseball cards yeah. A digital you can, you can, baseball card. Is it, because thing. and it's different than just having like a digital picture that you sell to people because it's it's unique. Like it has an identifier and it has a list of who's owned it and what it's sold for. So it, it makes it it integrates that sense of rarity, I guess, into the system that it it can't be duplicated or copy pasted or mm-hmm. anything like that. And they do it all for music and art and other things. <laughs> um, memes apparently you can sell f- the NFTs of the original meme. I don't. I don't understand all of it. It's bizarre to but me. But anyways, I, I can understand it on a theoretical level, but I don't understand it on a practical level. So we're trying to. <laughs> I think I really enjoyed how it turned out. I think Zach and I were talking about this choose your own adventure thing, which I've never written a full scale choose your own adventure. It's always kind of been on my bucket list, so uh-huh. I'm glad. But it starts off like the branches seem just kind of branch, but by the end, like they're drastically different endings. Mm. And I think where it's different than like your traditional choose your own adventures that, at least from my memory, those always seemed like they were almost storylines were completely unrelated. Uh-huh. And at least the way I wrote it, the world's consistent. Like, though you make this choice, everything else is still happening consistently. Okay. Ooh, interesting. Other places. But at least that's the idea. So, like, it's not like there's seven different worlds. It's like the same world, but you just happen to follow a different angle. Hmm. And so I think it worked out well. I enjoyed it. I'm actually working on a side quest right now for some for advertising basically with a bigger project that is taking other smaller projects and advertising them oh interesting but we're still trying to figure out the best way to deliver it but if you want to try it in its in its old school hard way to do it uh nft story dot cards would be the website to go to okay dot um, cards dot okay. cards yep you said it was, a lo- it was pretty long how many words was it twenty eight thousand. Oh, okay. if you read all of it i think we're going to actually print out a print version of the okay. book well, I mean, that because that is novella sized. Yeah. I mean, that's about the length of a uh, children. Oh, it's a little longer than some of our children of the well. Longer novellas. than mine. Mine were always low 20s. So, yeah, it was it was interesting. I think I ended up writing 36 individual Parts? sections. Okay. How many different endings are there? I don't know offhand. I need to count them hmm. because there's eight levels. Like, if you don't die till the end, or not die, but you don't have an ending before the longest story, uh-huh. there's eight sections to get to the end okay like you just keep branches it's not a very good structure in the sense that like you watch professional choosing adventures they'll have bottlenecks where everything kind of comes back to oh okay i didn't like that idea or i i also couldn't figure out how to do it (laughs) (laughs) with my writing style so this just is constant branchings so like you start kind of the same and the farther it goes the more like distinct the endings become okay cool so it was an interesting thing there should be a print version at some point as we get better at delivering it, I'll tell you. Okay. Well, stay tuned. I guess stay tuned about uh, Darian's story, yes, too. What are you going to do with it? Write the rest of it now? Potentially. Uh, I do want Make to... Make an NFT out of it? <laughs> no, probably not that. <laughs> uh, after after the play is done... Well, maybe before. I'm At some point, I'm going to send it to a couple other beta readers. I don't know if I'm going to publish it in any way yet. It is still... It's a long prologue. It wound up being longer than I expected. But I think it is it does still work best as a prologue to a longer story. Yeah, so, there, there's a few threads that really you'd have to change and make it yes, yeah, utterly stand, self complete standalone. Yeah. yeah, so we'll see. I mean, we'll see what 2021 looks like. I have to. This was definitely on my calendar for this year. I wanted to do this thing yeah. since my life had kind of settled into, and I, and it just it really worked out. Like honestly, probably the thing that really helped get this thing done was having a deadline. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Having to get it done before rehearsal started was probably the best motivating factor. So we'll see. Hopefully, it won't take another 18 years to to write more of this book. Thankfully, I think the upcoming chapters, I think, will be a little bit more self-contained than this uh, initial story idea yeah. was. So we'll see. Who knows? Exciting. But it's a beginning. It is a beginning, which is which is nice. It was not the beginning, but it was a beginning. <laughs> Indeed. That is uh, from Wheel of Time, all you wheel timers. Ah, I see. The beginning of every book starts that way. Oh, okay. Well, the, with the wind and stuff, yeah. Yeah, that's that's been all, also on my uh, reading list for this year at some point, especially now that... November 19th. It was that one that, oh man, I'm gonna I'm not going to get it read. The, I was hoping to I get think the 19th. first book. I think that's the day. I mean, because I wanted to read the book before a show was coming out. Uh, that show, I'm always like, 
am I going to hate it? Am I going to kind of like it? Am I going to just be grumpy the whole time? Like, I'm not putting a lot of expectations on it just because of how I deal with things based on books. Adaptations in Adaptations. Like, if we ever do the hijack of uh, Fellowship of the Ring, we'll see if my grumpiness has changed or not. So. <laughs> All right. That is the podcast for the day. Indeed. It was a happy day. And <laughs> actually, we're just going to stay here and hang out for a little bit. Yeah. No, I still need to finish this milkshake. Hopefully, it's getting kind of melty, but that's okay. Now we can order a new one. Well, that's true. There, I mean, our money's worth a lot now. Wow. Yeah. No kidding. We should go buy some comic books. That's true. And maybe a sports almanac. No. No, that's wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wrong I guess you're right. The podcast probably won't like that. Uh, like that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, thank you for listening, dear listeners. If you like our show, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get fine podcasts. You can email us at deroldtrains.gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Deroldtrains at gmail.com. What did I say? You said deroldtrains.gmail.com. Oh, yeah. That's not how that works. It's a website. <laughs> um, deroldtrains at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Topic ideas. Maybe let the show that you thought jumped the shark. I'm sure you have ones that we have not thought of. Yeah, or if there's one that you thought jumped the shark, and then they did something interesting with that. They fixed I'd love it to hear somehow. they fixed it somehow. I love to hear that too. Another example I could give you: Legend of Korra. Season two is not a good season, especially <laughs> the way it ends. But season three, probably their best season oh, nice. of, of that particular show. So you never know what uh, ha- creators can surprise you. And speaking of surprises, I guess you can subscribe to us on Twitter and Facebook. And maybe we'll surprise you there, or maybe we will just post episode posts. Mostly, yes, but we should be more creative. (laughs) Yeah. Anyways, Tim. Yes. Before we bow out and do the twist or something, (laughs) um, give us your soundtrack. My soundtrack. I decided to pick something from a Sonic franchise. Sonic has had a lot of ups and downs. I'm not an expert on the franchise, but I do know that different people will probably argue different times when the series jumped the shark. Some people would say when they went from 2D to 3D. In the mid-2000s, when they seemed to have a lot of issues trying to define what a Sonic game should be. And what an example of that was the game Sonic Unleashed. I've never played this myself. I know it had like daytime sections and nighttime sections when the nighttime Sonic turned into a werehog or something. Hmm. And people didn't like that, but, okay. but they liked the daytime stuff. So, because it was just normal Sonic stuff. But anyway, so this is a remix from that game called Adabat Sunset Speedway. It is remixed by Fasse or Fasiche. I'm not sure how you say his name, but him and Joshua Cruzina. So I got, I've got the four names today. You got, the, you got the four names today. Yes. But anyway, this is nice and groovy and hope you enjoy. Until next time, this is Tim. This is Nick. Adios. Bye-bye. <laughs>